Welcome to part four of this introduction to classification models for content management. Hello, I'm David Shaw, your instructor for this module on metadata models for content management. For more than 10 years, I've been developing metadata models and designing and developing solutions for component content management and learning content management systems. In part three, we finished with the development of a taxonomy. This laid the foundation for developing metadata. In this part four, we will examine how to develop a design approach and the development process and how to use metadata views as a framework. Finally, we will briefly look at implementing a content architecture. In previous modules, we discovered the difference between taxonomy and metadata. Taxonomy is a hierarchical classification of things in which a content object can only be placed in one node. Metadata, in contrast, is a flat model of information associated with the content, sometimes externally and sometimes internally. A title, for example, is internal metadata, and a good content management system will extract this rather than requiring you to key it into a form. We also discussed how a metadata field can incorporate a taxonomy. Finally, we also discuss the need to classify information to manage our always growing body of knowledge. We need metadata to classify and find information, refine searches, find sets of information, and for knowledge management. The design of metadata balances two competing priorities, adding value to the content to allow the easy navigation search and assembly of content into information products, and minimizing the effort and additional work of capturing the metadata. Some metadata will be optional, in which case it will be up to each business group to determine when that metadata will be used. Wherever possible, metadata will be automatically captured by the system. For example, the title of an object is important when browsing through a list of objects in the repository. The title of an object can usually be populated from information inside the object. The caption of an illustration might be automatically used as the title of the object. Similarly, the name of the last user to change an object, along with the date and time of the last change, will be automatically captured by the repository. The remaining metadata will require someone to fill in the metadata values. Wherever possible, the system will implement these types of metadata with pick lists or other techniques that minimize the time and effort required to fill in the metadata. Ideally, we should ask people to enter no more than seven fields of information. This is the development process that we reviewed for taxonomy, with the addition of a new step to develop metadata views. A view is a group or category or type of metadata, such as administrative or workflow. Views serve two purposes. A view corresponds to a business need, such as administering content, or the need to manage the workflow state as content is developed. Collectively, the views also provide a framework for developing a metadata model. Metadata views or types give us a framework for thinking about and designing and managing the metadata. Here are the ones we will discuss in this module. There can be a lot of overlap between these groups. It's not important to resolve these issues. The groups just give us a framework and checklist to help us design the metadata. The metadata term author, for example, might be used in the views administrative, publication, and rights management. Or in your organization, the administrative view might use a metadata term creator, and your organization has given us the author in the publication view. You are already familiar with structural metadata, so we will look at it first. Administrative and publication views are often closely related, so we will look at them after that. Structural metadata provides information about the internal structure of information resources. Examples include metadata that relates a part to the whole, such as chapter, or section, or page, or paragraph, or topic. 
Structural metadata facilitates navigation and presentation of information resources by allowing them to be broken up into logical parts without losing information or context along the way. Structural metadata is often applied to large information resources such as complex technical manuals that need to be divided into smaller parts for presentation to the end user, but that still need to be managed as a whole in many regards. Shown here are typical parts of a book structure. Similarly, a slide is a structural component of a presentation. Note that page and paragraph most likely lose their context as standalone objects. Typically, a topic is the smallest unit with a self contained context. There is often ambiguity. Some components, such as table and image, might seem to be both structural and descriptive. This was easier to think about when information was presented in a physical form like a printed book. It's less clear when everything is digital, but don't worry it too much. Ultimately, the business purpose and the source and the targets will guide your thinking. Here are some examples of administrative metadata. Many of them are found in the Dublin Core Standard, and you will find it very helpful to look this up and review the 15 core terms. And you will probably think of other terms related to your business. Administrative metadata is also often referred to as use or asset metadata. It can encompass a variety of metadata related to viewing, interpreting, using, and managing information resources over time. Examples of administrative metadata include information about the capture or encoding processes used in creating an information resource, such as file format, creator, creation date, date revised, language, and rights management information, to name a few. Administrative data is typically leveraged to provide content management functionality for information resources. Rights management is an example of crossover. As stated, it is often considered to be administrative, but in this tutorial we have separated it out as its own group. From a practical application perspective, Administrative metadata tends to be more closely associated with information producers than with information users, but there is overlap. For example, an end user might use the date last modified to make a judgment about the relevancy of a resource. Another feature of administrative metadata is that it is non-contextual. In other words, it provides little or no contextual understanding of what the information resource says or implies. For example, knowing when an information resource was created and who created it is useful information, but it does not further our knowledge of what the information resource is about. Here are some examples of publication metadata. Publication metadata describes the information product, such as a book, technical document, or a web page. Navigational metadata helps us find our way around an information product. It's helpful to have a table of contents listing chapters and sections, and the page numbers where we can find them. On the web, navigation is based on a taxonomy or metadata presented as a clickable hyperlink. Sometimes we need to hard code explicit machine metadata because we don't have the means to infer it from a higher level of abstraction. If a target product is web pages, you may need to consider if you explicitly need metadata such as link and ID ref, or if these can be generated from other more abstract metadata terms. Watch out for namespace confusion. We just referred to target as an output information product, but in a web page, target defines where to open the target document, for example, a new window, frame, or the same window. Life cycle metadata refers to the lifespan of information and its stages of life. There are different life cycle models. Some of them are simple, like create an information object, maintain and use the object, and dispose of the object at the end of its life. Disposal could mean archiving the information or destroying it. Others are more complex with stages like these shown in a government records management model. 
Here are some more metadata terms that might be used in managing the life cycle. Digital rights management describes the types of rights we have and the obligations we have to respect them. And who currently owns the copyrights? And when will they expire? Some types of rights are web only, print, presentation, restricted, unrestricted. Another standard worth looking up is the Open Archive Metadata Schema. Applicability metadata refers to where we use information. It may be sliced and diced according to geographical areas or specific functions like an aircraft's hydraulic system. System breakdown is an approach used to define different functions in a large system, for example, an aircraft. Information typing is the architectural basis of topic-based authoring and the practice of identifying types of topics that contain distinct kinds of information, such as concepts, tasks, and reference information. Topics that answer different kinds of questions can be categorized as different information types. Here are some more examples of applicability. Workflow metadata describes the state or step in the workflow. It should be system generated. At the first level, there should not be too many steps in the workflow. A good starting point for discussion is create, revise the information, review the information, edit it, approve it, publish it, and at the end of its life, archive it. Descriptive metadata is also often referred to as semantic metadata. It serves to describe and identify the intellectual content of an information resource. Examples of descriptive metadata includes keywords and abstracts, resource types, and any other domain-specific metadata that helps place the information in a specific semantic context. Descriptive metadata is a foundation for knowledge management, insofar as it can be made to describe the intellectual content and associations of information resources in a way that facilitates search and discovery. Metadata can be applied to information in different ways. Facets are used for navigation or to filter and refine searches. System metadata, such as the file type and size, is generated by the system. Custom metadata, that is the metadata that you define, can be attached to information objects or to tags embedded in the object. Tag elements within an object are also metadata. Here is an example of how you could document the application of metadata for users and as part of the governance process. Category helps users of the metadata to find and understand each item. Examples of categories are equipment groupings, general, applicability, life cycle, rights, and publication. Name indicates the canonical name of the metadata item. Label is the name of the term as it is presented to users. The label can change, but the name should never change. Applies to indicates what types of objects can have this metadata. The possible objects are repository object, content module, and information product. More than one type of object can have the metadata applied. For example, any object in the repository, including content modules and information products, will have a title. So for title, all three objects are indicated in the applies to columns. Required or optional indicates if some metadata is required. The most common reason for making metadata re required is when it is needed by an automated process, for example, in assembling information for a publication. Default or system generated. Wherever possible, the system will either generate a value for a specific metadata item or present a default value that the system user can change. Multiples allowed indicates if a metadata item can have multiple values for a single object. For example, a content module can have several contributors. To do this, the contributor term should be used as many times as necessary. Views or groups can be organized in a framework to help design how the metadata will be implemented. 
This is a real-world example for a complex technical area, so I won't give a lot of detail. However, you should be able to get the idea. S indicates system generated. P indicates extracted from the user profile. This leaves 13 fields that the user needs to complete. This is a high number. A good objective is around 7. Another way to reduce the burden on the user is to designate some user fields as required and make others optional. Optional means we would really like you to provide this information to make life easier for everyone, but we won't force you. Finally, when we implement taxonomy and metadata in a content management system, we have to develop the overall content architecture from source assets through information objects to the target outputs as information products. The information product shown here has a content model comprised of various information or content objects and digital assets like graphics and photos. The content management system will have a taxonomy and metadata for managing creation and production. The metadata will consist of objects for product, modules, components, and assets. There will also be one or more taxonomies and metadata filters for publishing and for users to search and find information. On the source side, there will be metadata for graphics and photos and possibly a taxonomy for these digital assets. Put together, these comprise the information or content architecture from the content sources to the output targets. This is the end of the introduction to taxonomy and metadata. There is a lot to consider in developing a comprehensive metadata model that is automated as much as possible. Hopefully by starting with the basics of a taxonomy, as we did in parts 1, 2, and 3, you are able to follow this module in metadata. Using a framework approach should be very helpful in your project. If you have any feedback or questions, please send me an email.